Amen. So last time we spoke about um, we don't want to be stumbling blocks and we don't want people to be stumbling blocks to us. We spoke about to abstain from all appearance of evil. Anything that looks evil, uh, anything you're not sure about, just don't do it. Abstain from it. Um, and uh, we also went through uh, some uh, scripture on how, on how um, in 1 Corinthians 5, we went through that. We'll just touch on that later on. But uh, we went through how there is really no mucking around when it comes to the church of God and, and how uh, it is handled when there's people um, openly living in sin and encouraging other people to live in sin. And we were talking about how the flesh doesn't need encouraging. And so um, everyone can do what they want in their own time. But in the church, it's a different story. And we spoke about that couple that were involved in fornication and how... Um, the church wasn't dealing with it and the Holy Spirit through Paul uh, rebuked the church more than the, the people that were committing that, that um, fornication. And so the world and the liberals would say they must have been a loving church and tolerating and embracing them. And that's the mentality that we have today. And it's actually the other way around. It's actually they couldn't care less about God's church. And so we, we do treat that seriously. However, you've got to have that perfect balance. A false ba balance is abomination in the, uh, to the Lord. And so you have to have that balance where not everyone's just going to overnight change. But that's what the church is for. But we do treat the church as literally the house of God. I wouldn't want any molester, murderer in my house. And so we, we don't want that for the church. And we don't want, we've got to have the, sp the spiritual discernment to get it early and to see if anyone's been damaging to, ch to the church in a spiritual way. Doctrine, and as we spoke about last, last, uh, last week. He, um, uh, we spoke about how uh, the Holy Spirit actually accuses the church, the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 5, as being puffed up. And that's the attitude of someone saying, well, who do you think you are to tell me what to do? But it's funny, you don't say that to the plumber, you don't say that to the electrician, you don't say that to the tradesman that comes by your house to fix, uh, fix something that's wrong in your house. But all of a sudden people are saying that to ministers trying to preach and teach the Word of God. And so we want to be careful with, with people like that in the church and also be careful that we're not one of those people. Um, uh, and so I don't want the Holy Spirit coming after me. I don't want I don't want to be doing anything in the church. We all don't want to be displeasing God. Church is supposed to please God. And so um, we spoke about that. We spoke about how extreme it was when Paul told them um, to deliver such one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's pretty extreme. That Paul's saying for these people, not to listen, I'm no longer talking to these people. I'm talking to you as a church now. And he's, he told them flat out to deliver them out there in the world. If they don't want God to deal with them, and if they're going to reject God's dealing with them, well, let the, let the world and let Satan deal with them. We spoke about that. That's First Corinthians 5, uh, 5, verse 5. So we're not making things up. We're just reading and expositing what the Bible says. And God help us. Uh, we want to do that. The, the chapter continues and says, you've got to purge out the old leaven. You've got to purge out that old leaven so that you may be a new lump. And it only needs a little bit of leaven to le uh, leaven the whole lump. And so um, we've got to get it early. And because of um, this world's doctrination or constantly just trying to creep into the church, uh, if you don't get it early, it's just going to take over. And so that's what's happening in a lot of churches, uh, not only the liberal churches, but um, in, in our circles. And it, it's a shame. Uh, verse 7, Purge out therefore old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, uh, that uh, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. That tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross so we can just keep living in sin. And that's what he uses. He uses that uh, in the same context of the fornicators and all of this. He's telling them 
uh, you have grounds to get them out and to purge them out because they're just going to keep influencing other people and you know what happens. Other people start pointing at them and say, well, they're doing it. Why can't I do it? Same, same thing. And so uh, we don't want that in the church. It's actually happened here, even though we're still a new church. It's happened where new people have come and the first time it's like, what should I wear? What, what should I wear? I'm coming to church. What do you want me to wear? Uh, yeah, yeah, cover up as much as cover cover up as much as you can. Then, funnily enough, one two weeks after, not asking no more, that that first fruit conviction was gone because coming in and seeing other influences, he started thinking, oh yeah, well this is just a casual church. I won't ask anymore, and he started coming in short shorts and and singlet tops. And so we got, we've really got to watch out on how we present ourselves because we don't want to be accountable for uh, uh, compromising a new person that just got saved or a young Christian. And then he comes in and sees, oh, well, maybe I'm just too uptight. Maybe I should just let loose. And then uh, that's, that's not a good testimony. And so we're working up to it. I had to learn that the hard way also. And all of us have to work. But if we don't preach on it, no one's going to know. But that's what happens in the background. A lot of people don't know. And I don't want to be that stumbling block um, letting someone else, uh, being an excuse for someone else to justify compromise or sin. I don't want to be that person. And I'm sure none of you guys want to be that person. And so we spoke about how there were things that Paul said to the first Corinthians church, uh, to the Corinthians church in the first epistle that he didn't write. He actually mentions that he wrote to them before this one, and it's First Corinthians. So, and then he said not to keep company with fornication, uh, fornicators. And so very, very clear there. And so very clear how he said, therefore, put away from among you that wicked person. And so um, uh, very clear on what to do. And so we also spoke about if um, you're a Christian that's not used to church life or not used to being saved or you just got saved and uh, uh, you don't really understand how x means y means z which means you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that um, as a good testimony why not just follow someone that you trust and I, I did that many times i don't fully understand what was going on and how to dress and how i need to present myself but when the penny dropped in my mind, and I started really getting convicted, um, I found a trusted, worthy few, few men, and I just thought, I don't know why they do that, but I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. They, they look like they have their life straight. Uh, I want to be like that, and there's nothing wrong with it, as long as they are following Jesus as well. And that's my first, my first uh, point. We also looked at Seth, Second Thessalonians and saw how Paul commanded them to do things that weren't in the Bible. He commanded them on different topics to do things. He said, just do what I say. I command you to do something. Don't be, uh, we don't want uh, brothers that are walking disorderly. And so if you need the meaning of disorder, just follow us, he said. Paul, Paul just followed us. Uh, he said, just do what we do and uh, the things that we command you. We also spoke about that. And that's, that's biblical as long as they are following Jesus, that person. And so, um, and this is why we're not talking about new converts. So we come to Philippians chapter three. We're talking about people that are told Paul, every time he's bringing up this subject, he's talking about people that have been saved for, for one, two, three years. And he's telling them uh, uh, to, to get their life right. And when they don't listen, he starts talking to the church on how to deal with it and sometimes if it's flat out open then he's saying purge it out we don't really like out uh, uh, the with the prodigal son you notice how the father he didn't relocate the house to the pig pen he waited for the son to come back home yeah we don't re relocate our lives we don't we definitely don't really relocate the church into the pig pen and I've heard many times as growing as a Christian, let's just go to the pubs, let's just go to the clubs and tell them about Jesus. No, no, you don't go in the pig pen. You tell them about Jesus outside of the pig pen. And so we, don't, we, we stay outside, we pray, 
We pray for them to get back right with God and that, that they get back on track. Um, and uh, we're obviously not saying that God isn't love. God is love and he will put someone in hell when they, tr when they don't trust Jesus Christ as Savior. That's, that's the best of both worlds. He's a, he's, a, he's a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. And so rejecting his son will end, up, will end someone up in hell. Um, God is a God of all grace. And if you don't repent and believe the gospel, you're going to die in your sins. That's, that's just how it goes. So Philippians chapter 3. So you notice when you go through the, through the epistles, you'll notice that God doesn't just want you to go to a church that believes the Bible. That's all well and good. But it doesn't just stop there. He, just, he doesn't just want you to go to a church that believes the Bible. He wants you to go. He wants you to believe the Bible. He wants, he wants you to play that part, apply the Bible in your life, not just walking into church and, and saying, I go to a Bible-believing church. He wants you to believe the Bible also. So um, uh, in, uh, don't turn here, but in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, it says there, Be ye followers of me, even as... I also am of Christ. So it's not wrong to follow someone if you're not sure about things, as long as they are following Christ. That's what Paul said. And in Philippians 3, he says it again. But we'll start at verse 13. Philippians 3, verse 13. The Bible says there, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So even Peter's saying, he doesn't count himself as perfect. He doesn't count himself as apprehended everything and understands the, everything about God. He's just saying, uh, one thing he does know is forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. So if you keep on hanging out with someone that keeps on talking about the past and how you used to hang out in the past, and that, that used to cause me a lot of damage. But I didn't have enough confidence to tell the, the people that I was hanging out with, can we stop talking about this? Because it would give me the shakes and then it would give you those memories. And then all of a sudden, now I don't want to spend time with the Lord because now I've got everything that I used to live for in, in the back of my mind. And this is what Paul's saying. So anyone that's doing that, why would you want to hang out with them if they keep reminding you of the past? Hang out with them, but give them the gospel. Let them know what you stand for, and God will do the rest. But we don't hang out with them and just uh, go on with, with their conversations. Evil conversation corrupt, corrupt good, good manners. And so you've got to be careful. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So I want to be pressing toward the mark with... Um, uh, opposition coming from outside the church, that's okay. But when you're trying to press toward the mark and there's opposition within the church, now you've got double trouble. Now it's, it's hard in two ways, from the world and from within the church. Even Paul is saying he's pressing toward the mark. He's pushing. He's pushing himself to get to that mark, the mark of the, uh, of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If calling is salvation, this verse would mean that Paul is working for his salvation. God hasn't called me. God called them and God called this. And God, before you can get saved, God has to call you and all this stuff that we've been speaking about in the Calvinism course. Uh, if you look at that, this is what I mean. If you're going to take those verses, you've got to put it in here too. And so when you put it in here, that would mean Paul was working for his salvation. That's, that's what he was doing. Because I pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. If the calling was salvation, that means he's trying to get saved. And he's pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. He's telling them, the church of Philippi, please, can we all be the same mind. Can we all have this same mind? All of us pressing toward the mark. All of us forgetting those things which are behind. That's what he's saying. The last thing you need is someone in the church trying to drag you back there and trying to tell you that you're too much pressing toward the mark. That's the last thing you need. Your flesh is already doing that. 
We don't need more fleshes. We need more spirit. We need more Holy Spirit. And so he's saying, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So he's saying, if you've got anything else uh, in your mind, or if you have another opinion, just hold on, keep pressing toward the mark, because God will reveal it to you. God didn't just reveal everything at once when I first got saved. And praise God for that, because if he had showed me now, I would have given up. And so he lets you learn as you go. And as you go, that's what he's saying. God shall reveal even this unto you. Verse 16, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Don't go backwards. Let us hold ground, he's saying. So when it gets tough, let's, uh, whatever ground we've already attained, let's stay there. Don't move. Don't go backwards. Let us walk step by step by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. So we all got our minds on the same thing. We're all pressing toward that mark. And the Bible says in 17, <clears throat> Brethren, be followers together of me. See, now he's talking to the people that still don't get it. Now he's talking to the people that um, have still got otherwise minded, that are still otherwise minded, not, not fully in the uh, pressing toward the mark and, and still thinking backwards. But he's saying, just like 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he said, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. So he's saying, be followers of me and also those ones that are also following me and that are also following Jesus Christ. He's saying, mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So mark those that walk so as ye have us for an example. So you don't, what a blessing. This is why we, you're supposed to love coming to church. This is why you're supposed to love church more than just new relationships and new fellowship. It's people that are following Christ and you get the word of God and you get people practically following Christ and you can watch them follow Christ too. Or you can be the one that testifies and is a good testimony for people to follow you as you follow Christ. That's why when we talk about husbands and wives, that's for everyone, not only the people getting married, that's for the old people and the young people because everyone's supposed to be giving counsel to people in the church and we're all supposed to be like-minded not necessarily believing exactly the same but like-minded and so he's saying mark them which walk the ones that have uh, an uh, that are in an sample so that's just example as plural uh, verse 18 for many walk of whom i have told you often and now tell you even weeping He's telling them grievous. He's weeping that they are the enemies of the cross, uh, of the cross of Christ. And so what's he saying? He's saying the ones that aren't work, walking as an example, as an example for you to follow Christ, these people, I tell you, weepingly, crying. He's telling them grievously. He's not telling them proudly. He's telling them, these people are the enemy of the cross, the cross of Christ. They're not walking with Christ. They're walking against Christ. And so he is saying there clearly, mark them that walk according uh, to the Spirit uh, and, and according to how Paul is walking. So nice. Um, uh, so sorry, that's someone that I can follow and you know that they're following Christ. I can get advice from, and as long as they are following Christ, I can, I can take commands from them. I can take uh, recommendations from them. I can do all that from them. There's, there's no problem with it, uh, as long as you know that they're following Christ. Now, he's saying, mark the good ones. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 16. Romans ch chapter 16. So it's not wrong to mark people that you know following Christ, people that you know that they know the Bible and they're living it. 
it's not wrong to follow uh, that. We all need that. I've, I've, I've had that before and I still have that now. But you don't only rely on that. You've got to have your own reading time, your, your own dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, but it is absolutely uh, biblical to get recommendation, advice from other men and women that are following Christ. Romans, we'll cut this one short. Romans chapter uh, 16, uh, verse 17. Paul says here, Now I force you, brethren. He didn't say that. None of this is forcing. All of this, it might be hard on some people, but all of this is recommendation. We can't force you to do anything. Holy Spirit can't force you. Paul didn't force them. He said, now I beseech you. I beseech you. That's, I'm pleading with you. Verse 17, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which we, that ye have learned and avoid them. Wow, he really gives it to them. So Philippians 3, he said, Mark them that are walking like Paul, walking that are, good, that are ex examples of him, walking after Christ. And here he's telling them, Mark them which cause division. Division, offenses, contrary to what? Contrary to how you get along with them, contrary to uh, how nice they are. It doesn't say anything about that. It's saying contrary to the doctrine. Contrary to what the Bible says, which ye have learned, so he knows they've learned it, and avoid them. He's not saying they're not saved. He's not saying anything else. He's just saying causing division, division causing offenses, contrary to what we teach in the Bible and what the Bible says. It says, which ye have learned, you should already know that. He's telling the, the Roman church, he's telling them, you've already learned the doctrine. And you continue to learn them. And he says, and avoid them. Verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, why would we throw them out? They're so nice. Why, why are they not welcome here? They, we got along with them. The Bible's saying here that they've got good words and their fair speech. They've got good speech. They deceive the hearts of the simple. So it's very obvious here that Paul is warning against people that are nice and got nice words, and, uh, uh, but they still cause division in Christ. They can be so nice and uh, they, can, uh, they can be so nice and be an offense to the doctrine which we teach. They absolutely can. They might. Um, be nice, and they might even be serving. But they are serving their own belly, the verse says. Uh, what happens to the hearts of the simple? The hearts of the young Christians, the even the old Christians. The Bible here is saying, if you think that you can just take these people on, you're simple. You're simple in mind, you're simple in heart. Because Paul just said, avoid them. And um, again, I'm talking about church. You can do what you like in your, in your life, but I'm talking about church. The hearts of the young Christians are deceived. The hearts of the old, some of the old Christians are deceived. And the hearts, any, uh, the, the hearts of anyone trying to live for Jesus is deceived. And you don't need much. You don't mean, need much. It's already hard enough in the world. You don't need much in the church to just throw in the towel and give it up. And it, also, it almost happened to me. And I'm not playing the pity party. I've had it happened to me but i've also been the wrong person toward people and i'm not going there anymore god help me i, I won't be that one that person anymore going around uh questioning what the pastor preached on and causing trouble in the church that won't happen again and god help me anyone that preaches grace f through faith i won't preach against them we'll just preach what the word says and if that goes against what they believe then so be it but we're not we're not setting up a website just to go after other preachers. It's hard enough already. It really is. And so God told us to avoid these people. And we don't want to be subject to being deceived. That's the, the flesh does enough of that. Uh, uh, the game's changed when you get saved. I, got a bit, I went back into being a bit naive 
and a bit like what Jesus says, a bit like a little child, but then learned quickly that that's not the case. There still was dog eat dog. There was, there was still paranoia. We don't want it in the church. We don't want it in the church. There's enough of that in the world. We, we don't want that in the church. We are trying to follow the Lord and that's, that's hard enough, uh, let alone having other voices within the church. And you have to battle the voices coming from without the church also. So we all need to watch out for these people and we've got to watch out that we're not one of the, these people. But the Bible actually uh, absolutely told us in Philippians 3, mark them which walk and follow them. Uh, whenever you have queries about what the Bible says about certain things, follow them, cling on to them, and then mark them that uh, cause division and contrary to the uh, and offenses contrary to the doctrine and avoid them. Mark the good ones, cling on to them. Mark the bad ones, stay away from them. That's what the Bible says. And so you got to ask yourself, who do you, even children, who do you choose to hang out with? Who do you prefer to be with? The, re the re rebellious person that won't sing, that won't listen, that won't pay attention in church, that won't obey, or the kids that love Jesus and trying to live for uh, and do the right thing. So uh, that's very clear. Mark the right ones, cling to them, uh, avoid the wrong ones. Very, very simple. Uh, Philippians 1.33, uh, not, uh, sorry, not Philippians, uh, Psalms. Psalm, the book of Psalm 133. This is what you miss out on. Many people miss out on, many churches miss out on when you're not in unity. Psalm 133. Again, we'll look at the, the good and the bad. The good is, Psalm 133, the Bible says there, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. That's good and pleasant. Let's turn that around. Behold how bad and unpleasant it is to dwell in disunity. So that's, when you have disunity... Uh, you get bad and unpleasant when you have unity and you follow the Bible and you, you see what the Bible says and you believe it. The Bible says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell uh, together in unity. On the other hand, Proverbs 6, next book over, Proverbs 6, God is telling us there how great life can be when promoting the unity of the brethren. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6 verse uh, 16. Remember verse 16 as we read. The Bible says there, These six, six things doth the Lord hate. Where's the liberals? God doesn't hate anything. He loves everything. What's the Bible say? These th six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven and an ab are an abomination unto Him. So we all know um, sodomy, homosexuality is an abomination. Let's see what else is an abomination to the Lord. So God is love, but this verse just told us that He hates some things. And... Uh, Abomination, not only sodomy, not only LGBT. Let's see what else. Verse 17, a proud look. All guilty. A lying tongue, even more guilty. And hands that shed innocent blood. How's that? Lying tongue and proud look right next to murder. And for us, I know no one's murderer here, but when you wreck a young Christian's life and you talk and you get them to compromise their devotion to the Lord because they just got saved and they want to go out and tell people about Jesus, you're shedding innocent blood. Now, when you're being a stumbling block to a young Christian, so I'd be very careful what you tell people in the church um, because that's just as, just as bad as shedding innocent blood. Verse 18, And heart that des de deviseth wicked imaginations... 
feet that be swift in running to mischief. That's what we've read in the New Testament. Uh, wicked imaginations and troublemake, uh, troublemakers. Verse 19, a false witness, there's lying again, someone being a false witness that speaketh lies, and he, a person, verse 16, these th six things that doth the Lord hate, seven an abomination, and now it says, and he, that's a person, uh, doesn't matter. See, again, world doctrination, too much of it into your mind and heart, you're going to have a problem with the Bible. Why don't you just leave it as it is? That's what it says. These six, six things that doth the Lord hate, seven are abomination, and 19, he that soweth dis discord among the brethren. How's that? It didn't say he lost his salvation or anything. God's very serious about brethren in the church. God is very serious about brethren sowing discord, disorderly in the church, and it's going to be dealt with. So God help us not to be uh, not to be one of us and me included. I can get told by uh, my pastor that you, you're not good there. You're causing discord. But God help us not to be any of us. Again, it didn't say lose your salvation. God hates people and God hates discord among the brethren. That's what he hates. You know why? Because it goes beyond just the testimony. That's the Christ's body. That's the bride of Christ. That's the house of God. And he wants order and he doesn't want discord. That's why it says that these, th these six things that the Lord hate and seven are an abomination. That's extreme hatred. Just like the sodomites and the homosexual. Extreme hatred to that sin. And he, it says, he that soweth discord among the brethren. You know why? Because that Christian should know better. The one that's among the brethren should know better. And that's why the Bible says that in Proverbs. But don't forget Psalm 133, uh, Psalm 133, one that where we just came from. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to, to dwell together in unity, in unity. So that's both sides there. And this is why I say, you, when you preach the gospel, when you speak about people, about God, you ought to see both sides. God of love, God of wrath. And he's not mucking around when he's talking about his church. He's not mucking around when he's talking about his house. Abomination, extreme hatred, detestation. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. It's not only one sin. It's the way of the wicked completely. And so... Um, that's a serious, serious passage. So God is saying, watch out for people like this and watch out we don't become people like this. Discord, abomination unto the Lord. So this happens also with parents trying to raise up children. If uh, they don't uh, deal with the rebellious teen, now that rebellious teen or that little 10-year-old is ruling the house and the house is going to become a mess. Same thing with house, same thing with society, same thing with the classroom. If you tolerate undisciplined, inappropriate behavior in a classroom, soon the whole school system is out of control. And that's what you, that's what you see now. God help us for that not to happen in a church. So there's, there's a great balance between love, tolerance, and discipline, and uh, discord and dis disorderly. So that's how the liberalism crept into the church and crept into society. So if it's true about society, if it's true about the classroom, it's, it's absolutely true about the, the house of God. So God says it's true about the church and he, he is serious about it. Uh, let's just take one more uh, passage about um, this uh, ungodly and hatred that the Lord has. Go back in your Bible uh, to Second Chronicles. So go back, Second Chronicles. So go past Psalm, Job, <coughs> and then you get to Second Ezra. You get to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, uh, chapter nineteen. 
and verse 1. So he's an example of King Jehoshaphat. Um, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 1. And Jehosh Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. Uh, and Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. So seer, that's like a prophet. That's someone that can discern spiritual things. And this Jehu, Jehu went out to meet this king to speak to him. So I went out to meet him, verse 2, and said to the king Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? That's a question, but he's trying to make him realize, why are you trying to help the ungodly? He's saying, why are you loving them that hate the Lord? The verse continues, Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So wrath is coming against this king, but we're going to read in a minute verse 3. But this, this man, this prophet is pointing out to him, are you really helping the ungodly? The enemies, the people that have no interest in, in God? Are you really loving that person that hate the Lord? We're not supposed, we're not expected to support satanic people. We're not expected to, um, uh, or any other church that has a message sending people to hell. We don't support them. We don't affiliate with them. And that's biblical. Um, and it says the ungodly. And this man is telling the king, are you really helping the ungodly? Are you really loving the people that hate the Lord? Flat out reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And it might sound tough, but you don't fall in love with people that hate the Lord. You preach the gospel to them. So that's how we show our love. And really, it's not our love. It's the love that the Lord has. And so love them by giving them the gospel. Love them by telling them about Jesus. Your love individually is not going to fix anyone. It's only the love that Jesus Christ showed on the cross. That's what changes lives. That's what fixes people. And so we have nothing to do with that. So when a satanic person walks past me on the streets or anything, it's just strictly gospel. It's gospel. We're not told to hate everyone. Well, it's strictly gospel. Homosexuality uh, walks past gospel. Jesus Christ. That's what we're telling them. They can reject, they can do what they want. But this king was being rebuked for loving people that did not want anything to do with God. And uh, he was getting rebuked for loving people that hated the Lord. What did he say? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Did he lose his position? No. But this, this prophet told him, because you're helping the ungodly, and loving them that hate the Lord, the wrath is upon thee. Uh, the wrath of God is going to be upon thee. And then let's read verse 3 on a positive note. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee. There you go. So just because he's getting rebuked doesn't mean this king just goes, throws in the towel and gives up. He's telling, he's telling him, nevertheless, so there's the balance. You did wrong. Wrath is going to be upon you. However, verse 3, Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. That's a great king. Very good. Very good. He's, he's worked out the groves. He's gotten rid of all the idol worship and everything they were caught into. And he, his heart is actually seeking God. He had good traits, this king. But he had to be point, it had to be pointed out to him that there was wrong. There was some things wrong that he was doing. And again, the liberals would say, where's the love? Where's, where's, it's all hate. Where's this? Yeah, we're told. We're told to give them God, the gospel. Not just to tell them that God loves them in the state that they're in. I've said it many times. You tell, you tell a pedophile that God loves him, he's going to think that just God loves him just how he is. And there's no reason for him to change. Same thing with any sinner. And so same thing within the church. We're not supposed to just pat people on the back and say, no, no, you're fine. Just, just do what you want. You know, this is God's house, but, you know, we can violate the word of God. And as long as you feel good and accepted and tolerated. 
That's not how it works. Acts chapter 5. So it's tough. It's not, not easy. But like I said before, it's nothing personal. Uh, we're just being faithful stewards of what is God's. It's God's church. You've got to do what the Bible says. And we are definitely not a social club, as most of you guys have uh, worked out already. We don't hire co other companies to find out what lost people are looking for in a church and then cater for them. We, we don't do that. A lot of companies do that. If you want to make money, you can do that. But we're not making money. We're, we, we, we've got no interest in making money. We're, we're interested in what pleases God and, and doing what God said in His house. So we cater to what God wants in His church. We don't cater for what people want in the church. We don't cater for... If, if Elon Musk got saved and he started coming to this church and he gave just as much as giving Trump, 45 million I heard a month, yeah? It'd still be the same thing towards him. Same thing. There'd be no difference whatsoever. No difference. It would be the same thing towards him. If he told me you've got to calm down and whatever and violate the word of God, I'd say to Mr. Elon Musk, the door's there. Sorry. It's... That's, that's just not how we work. Um, so Acts chapter 5, uh, we have an example here of a church. Acts chapter 5. Let's go to chapter 4 quickly. Acts chapter 4. And we'll close here. Acts chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 29. Verse 29. So this is the early church. Paul's there. Great uh, uh, Peter's there, sorry. Great, um, great church. Uh, this is a great prayer here. I like to start on 29 because it's a good one. It's a great prayer for all churches. The verse 29 says, so uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 29. And now, Lord, he's praying. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. We don't want threatenings within the church. He's talking about threatenings coming without the church, coming from outside of the church. The last thing we want is threatenings in the church, as we've read. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word. Now, it's already hard enough to speak thy word, to speak uh, the word of God. And they're asking for boldness to speak that word of God. So without hesitation, without, with, without doubting, he wants certainty and power to come from, they want power to come from them to preach the word of God. So what don't we need? We don't need people questioning every little thing that's said as we preach the word of God. That's why I'm always encouraging rather than discouraging. And even if someone says something wrong while they're witnessing to someone, you don't stop the conversation and say, hold on, I'm the witnessing police. You just said something wrong, take that back, and there you go, that you lose the unbeliever. So that's the last thing we want. We've all said things that are wrong. And so, especially when you're dealing with souls, most of the time it's the Spirit doing the work anyway. And most of the time it's verses that are penetrating, and not the, the man uh, using his crafty, well-known speech to win, to convert the soul. So it's the Word of God that converts. And so they want boldness while they speak the Word of God. Verse 30, By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Okay, so back then, the rest of the New Testament, we'll get into this in a Wednesday night coming. We'll study the different ages. But we don't have the signs and wonders. We, get, we have people getting saved. That's even better. But back here, the rest of the Bible wasn't uh, written. And so God gave them signs, wonders for the Jews to win them over. But once the Bible was complete, these were gone. And so we'll get into that later. So by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Not by the apostles, not by the men, but by the word. And the holy child, we've seen the word in the last verse, and the holy child Jesus. And when they had, uh, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all, all filled with the Holy Ghost 
and they spake the word of God with boldness. Praise the Lord. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and were of one soul. Notice there's no arguing. There's no division. There's no strife. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. So they, they were that full of the Holy Spirit. And they were that together in one unity. None of them counted their own to be theirs. They said that the whole church owns everything. Everything that's mine is theirs. Everyone is everything. Neither did they say that aught of things that they possessed was his own. Their houses, their possessions was the churches. That's how they thought of it. That's how they, that's how they were uh, conducting themselves. Their common ground was Jesus Christ. Verse 33, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Praise the Lord. It's going to be hard to have grace when you have different divisions and different cliques in the church. So when the Lord saw this and they, they thought we're all one, nothing is mine, everything that's mine is all ours, the Lord gave them great grace and it fell upon them. Verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. So they all brought their houses, all the prices of their lands, and they brought it to the church and they gave it to the church. Now, if you don't believe in different ages in the Bible, well, you should do that today then. And we're waiting. So that's what they did back then. And I've said this before and no one's done it yet. So we do believe... <laughs> We do believe that there's different ages in the Bible. We, we don't do this today, but in a spiritual sense, we do it. Everything I know is all yours and everything you know is all ours. And Jesus saves and we'll do as much as we can to get that young Christian or the person that just got saved up on his feet. What does that require? No strife, no division, no contention, no discord, no disorder. That's what it requires because they're so sensitive. As soon as they see that, they're going to say, I'm out of here. You guys are just like the pub down the road. That's, that's what we don't want. Verse 35, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And I'm still waiting for that. And uh, distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. What a blessing. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1. So we understand they bought, they sold their houses, bought the land, bought the price, gave it to the church. But that's that's a big however here. Verse five, chapter uh, sorry, chapter five, verse one. But a certain man named Ananias with his uh, with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession. So they went and sold it. They were part of the church. This couple, and what they do, verse two, and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privily to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So what are they doing? They sold their possession. They wanted to look like they were doing everything else that everyone else was doing, but they held some back. Instead of just telling them, look, we're going to hold some back because we need it, what they do? They broke what the church was doing. They, they broke, they, they didn't do what everyone else in the church was doing, but what they do, they made out that they were. They pretended that they were, but they held some back. What happened? Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Notice, Ananias wasn't foaming of the mouth and uh, demon possessed. He walked in normal, church normal, but he let Satan deceive him. And he let Satan... Uh, deceive his heart to a lie and hold back some of the money, some of the part of the land. And of course, Peter knew. Holy Spirit knows. So you might be fooling some people, but you're not fooling God. And so the Holy Spirit knows, and these people aren't in unison. They're not united and they're not doing what the, whole, the rest of the church were doing. They were trying to get away with some things and holding back some things. And so that's, that's not unity. And so verse 4, so we're using this as application. We're not saying go do this tomorrow. We're, we're using this as an application 
to people that are in disagreement to the church and what happens? They try to lie, they try to deceive and they let Satan uh, fill their heart with this lie to hold back. And verse 4, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? So Peter's saying, why are you holding back? Who are you lying to? The possession was already yours. It was already yours to start with. Who are you lying to? It was already, wasn't it already thine, thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Was it not in thine own power? So he's telling him, it was yours before it sold, and it was yours after it sold. Who are you trying to deceive? Why hast thou convinced this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So anyone not in unity with the church, he's, that's between you and God. That's why we can't force anyone to do anything. These people were saved and he let Satan put this lie in his heart where he can act like he's part of the church in unity, but he wasn't in his heart. That's a miserable place to be. Verse 5, what happened? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon all them that heard these things. This is why it needs to be dealt with. This is why the church, the first, uh, the Corinth church was getting rebuked because it's not being dealt with. And what's it going to do? It's going to start spreading. The leaven will start to spread. The Holy Ghost here, the Holy Spirit here dealt with it on the spot. And look what happened. Great fear came upon all them that heard these things. When it's dealt with, the next person thinking about it is going to choose not to if they care anything for the church or being in church. And that, that goes the same with society. You hang someone for a serious crime, the next time someone thinks about that serious crime, they're going to think twice about it. But as long as you put them in jail and give them PlayStation to play all day, well, there's not going to be any control. That can happen out there, but it's not going to happen in the church. We're not going to have spiritual criminal activity happening in the church so that we can just lose everyone to the flesh and no one living in the spirit. That's a serious crime to the church. Verse 6, And the young men arose, uh, wound him up and carried him out and buried him. Same thing happened to his wife. She comes in, same thing happens, dead. And that's how you get dead Christians. That's how you get dead Christians, not in unity. Uh, let's go to verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. This church has power from God, and they have unity, blessed unity, praise God. And guess what? Just because that happened with Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't just stop church and they kept on going with blessed unity, power from God. God had a church in that city that Christ rejectors were scared to go to. And the people part of the church had fear also. They thought, man, we better not lie to the Holy Spirit. We better not cause any division, any discord, because look what happened to Ananias and his wife. So fear is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. We've got to get this mentality of the world out, out of the church, out of our minds, out of our hearts. It was um, because they knew and people feared it and Christians feared the church because they knew God would change their lives. A lot of people are scared to get saved because God will change their lives. A lot of Christians are scared to repent and believe the Bible because they're scared that God will change their lives. They're scared. It's, God is going to change your life for the better. He's not going to change your life to, for the worse. But He's not going to pry your hands off the, that sin. He's not going to pry your hands off the things that you want to keep clinging on to. You should be clinging on to those that are following Jesus Christ. And verse um, uh, 13, And of the rest, there is no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And I've said it before, a man and a man holding hands should be scared to enter our church. They should be. Christ rejectors, people that hate God, they should be fearful to come into church if they're coming in comfortably then something's wrong they should be fearful to come into church and that's biblical that's what the bible says and christians should be should be on their toes 
when they're in church, should be on their toes about living for the Lord, should be very careful on how they will. It's not flamboyant um, uh, path to take. It's very, very, very serious, very careful. And verse 14 says, and believers, see, they're believers, were the more added to the church, multitudes, both men and women. We don't have to worry about being tolerant, being loving. God will add people to the church. The Bible says, and believers were the more added to the church. You know what happened? When those people that were scared to join the church, when they actually gave it, gave it up and they got saved and they started coming to church, you couldn't get them out. See how the whole thing changes. And it ends on a very good note. Very good note. Those people that are willing to subject their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word, they can't wait to get in church. So we're not pushing people out. We want people to come in. We absolutely do. But we must preach this side of the Bible. Don't be part of the list of ab abominations to the Lord. Don't be someone that is a threat to the work of God and the church of God. Don't be someone that Christians have to mark to avoid. Be the person that people are marking to follow as you follow Christ. Don't push uh, to lower the standards. That's something I did and I'll never do again in my Christian walk. Don't push any of these. Don't be any of these, these people. Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of the high standards. It is black and white. A lot of the Bible is black and white. I am black and white because light and darkness. The Bible talks about light and darkness. The Bible talks about hot and cold and we don't want to be lukewarm. I think uh, Jesus Christ is absolutely worth us being on fire, being hot for the Lord. Everyone has something in their lives that shouldn't be there, but I hope none of us are defending it, and I hope none of us are excusing it, because it shouldn't be excused. I hope none of us is go uh, going against God. Purge it out. We've got to purge it out of our lives. We've got to purge it out of the church. And look, we talk this, but it's very, very seldom that it happens. It's very rare that it happens. But when it does happen, God help me, I'm going to deal with it early. So like I said, God is worthy. Uh, Jesus Christ is worthy of more than that. He's worth our highest standards. Let's close in a word of prayer.